And so and we come to this time of year where, of course, uh, the theme is forgiveness and Shiva doing our own acknowledgments of the ways that we are uh, challenged and broken and struggling and uh, finding the courage and strength to return. Uh, and the work of the season, as we know, uh, in building community and repairing relationships is about uh, asking for forgiveness, owning, uh, taking responsibility for what we've done, and the really difficult work of forgiving uh, others, those who have harmed us, betrayed us, hurt us, uh, to really find a way to uh, become someone who can forgive uh, the ways that we have been hurt. So uh, I've lived the high holidays my whole life. Uh, and find them incredibly powerful, always have, and I find this idea of forgiveness so incredibly uh, important. And I really have struggled with it my whole life as well. Um, I grew up with a mother who suffers from borderline personality disorder uh, and narcissism. And for any of you who know anyone like that or any other kind of disorder that causes a lot of pain in family systems, the holidays, because they were so deep and so powerful for me and so that work so holy, I was really challenged always about how do we forgive someone who's not sorry? How do we forgive someone who has absolutely no remorse, who takes zero responsibility for their behavior, for the ways that they've hurt you, for the pain that they've caused, and that if they had the opportunity, they would do it again right now gleefully? What, what do we do with that as mature, responsible, spiritual beings who are trying to be better people? And what we hear, or what I have heard a lot in my life, is that the spiritually mature person forgives anyway because it's about you. It's not about them. They don't need to ask. And I'm not saying this is not true for people at all. Um, we are to forgive anyway because it's about us and it's about letting go. Letting go of the hurt, letting go of being a victim, letting go of the anger. And so forgiveness really isn't about the other person, it's about you. That has never, ever worked for me. Ever. If it works for people, that is fantastic because then you slide right into the theme of, you know, the holidays and you're golden. But for those of us that it really doesn't work for and actually feels incredibly disempowering, um, I've, I've really struggled to, uh, to figure out what to do with that. And so um, I want to have that conversation uh, with you in our room um, about when forgiveness is not the right paradigm. Are there other words, are there other phrases, are there other practices, are there other concepts and, and real ways of changing that allow us to heal? and allow us to become the more um, whole person that we want to be? Uh, and then how do we as rabbis model and talk about that, particularly at this time of year, so that other people who are really struggling with a relationship or relationships in which they do not experience forgiveness as the way forward, how do we, um, how do we give them um, recognition and honor that there are other spiritual ways of being and interacting at this time of year that are equally powerful, just different. Uh, um, as a lesbian adoptee who was born not Jewish and converted as an infant, um, I'm rather used to being kind of outside of the normal paradigm and talking from the margins about just about any topic within the Jewish world or our uh, ritual practice or time of year or anything else. Um, I have to say that this particular topic um, I never spoke about. Uh, it was really, really difficult. And I've spoken about a lot of really vulnerable uh, things from the Bima, and especially in the last few years, um, searching for my birth family and finding birth family, all this kind of stuff that um, was really also touching and moving to speak about. Um, when I decided to speak about this topic, um, it was a really difficult decision to do because I knew it was going to be really hard. Um, and I cried. We have back-to-back -back services because we can't find a space big enough for uh, our community to all be together. And so I had to give the sermon twice um, and cried through a good, you know, part of the beginning of giving it um, the first time. Because I think this, this topic of what it means to hold a relationship in which one does not feel 
that one has the ability, and I'm gonna say even the need to forgive, means we're already starting from a place of carrying a lot of pain. Uh, because if we're struggling with it, it usually means it's a close relationship. Right? It's not a casual relationship because those relationships you cut out of your life if you realize this is not somebody who's, this is somebody who's going to do it again. This is somebody who um, is not interested in repairing the relationship or changing the, the dynamics of the relationship and I'm going to continue to get hurt. And so the healthy and responsible mature thing for me to do is to move on. Um, when, we, when, the, when we continue to struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle, it's often because it's somebody we either don't want to cut out of our lives or it's somebody we have cut out of our lives, but who's supposed to be, you know, according to family systems, you know, the, the way we talk about kinship terminology or the way society uh, tells us we're supposed to be involved with our family members, um, that they're supposed to be part of our lives. And we, and we can't make that happen for whatever reason. I finally decided to speak about this. The first uh, time I did was in the Jewish Journal um, when they asked me to write about Mother's Day. <coughs> Um, and they, they asked me to write as an adoptee, uh, you know, just kind of like that it's not the normal mother-daughter experience or, you know, experience of uh, relating to one's mother. Uh, and so they had no idea what they were going to get when they asked me just as an adoptee to write about this. Um, my mother had had a, a massive stroke uh, that has left her completely incapacitated, unable to use uh, any kind of phone or uh, computer. Uh, and therefore, I knew she wouldn't be able to access, you know, this material. And, and so I finally decided that I could speak about this without harming her or hurting her. Uh, and so decided that probably it was time and gave this, uh, so I wrote this article for the Jewish Journal. I have copies um, of it for you. Um, because there's, there's lots of times and lots of ways, I think, as rabbis that we can address where people are in their really, really damaging relationships, not just at the high holidays. Um, so one of the things I guess I want to start with is to say this is not just about a sermon at the high holidays. It might be, but it might be a bulletin article. You know, it might be a Facebook post that you write. It might be just a way of reaching out to someone who you know is in a difficult relationship. And I think for us as rabbis to model and share our own struggles with our Jewish concepts <coughs> and, and the ways we're, we're, of course, modeling and teaching what we do at the high holidays in this case. Um, but I think it's also so important to, to relate our struggles that we've had with what's the very thing we're teaching, right? The, physician heal thyself, right? That we teach what we most need to learn. And for me, coming out about this, which was the most difficult coming out I've ever done. I came out at 16 as a lesbian, so that's like <laughs> so, right? like so long ago. Um, this was a really difficult coming out um, for me, and I found it incredibly powerful. So we talk about forgiveness, slichot is coming. Someone mentioned slichot comes first. Like we, we begin already with the language before Rosh Hashanah about slichas, right? you know, lisloach, to forgive. Uh, and we move into the whole high holiday season if you're preparing through Elul, of course, it's, you know, you're, you're readying yourself to get to slichot, to begin talking about this idea of forgiveness and moving into the, the preparation for doing that incredibly difficult work of asking for and for granting forgiveness. And many of us, of course, know, you know, the Chazal, our, our sages taught us that we need to ask forgiveness from someone three times. Why, why do we have to ask, why do I even bring this up, how many times you have to ask somebody for forgiveness? And, and I think, for me, the, one of the compelling answers is because they understood how difficult it is to forgive. The rabbis understood that it was difficult to forgive. So they make people ask three times, right? That, that they understand that to just go to somebody, even if you're really, really sorry and really communicate that beautifully, it's a really hard thing to forgive someone. And so I, I love that, that the rabbis got that. That forgiveness for us, of course it's humiliating to ask for forgiveness, to be vulnerable, to admit and take responsibility and say that out loud, to face the person. Of course we, we know that. Everybody kind of assumes that because we, we all have lived that. I think it's another thing to, to realize that the rabbis acknowledge it's also a really difficult thing to forgive. Because it means we risk, right? We, we risk trusting again. We risk believing that things could be different this time with this same person. And we choose to believe that. We choose to lean into that kind of optimism and the sense of possibility. We talked about Yom Harat 
right, Ha'olam, and um, it's actually, this is the day of the pregnancy of the universe. <laughs> not, for me, or the, the, what resonates is not birth. It's not the birth, it's the potential, right? It's the, the universe is filled with itself, and it's what's possible that we're celebrating on Rosh Hashanah. It's not here yet. So the, the courage that it takes to, to believe that it's possible to have a relationship with someone that isn't in reality yet, that's what Rosh Hashanah is all about. That we, we choose to act as if it's possible to have something that isn't yet. And to help, of course, create that through relationship. So, so Chazal understand, our sages understand that it's difficult. We, we, if we've been betrayed and we've been hurt, we understand the difficulties in forgiving. And of course we know as, as mature human beings that it's the best thing to do. We've known this for a very long time. Forgiveness has been in the human culture for a very long time. It's a very early concept, right? Because it solidifies bonds, it solidifies relationships, it allows for repair that keeps the tribe functioning and therefore keeps the tribe strong and therefore leads to everybody's survival rates going up. And so forgiveness, I think, is absolutely critical. So I don't want in any way to suggest that forgiveness is not central to healthy communities, healthy relationships, um, healthy, divine, human relationships. I, I think it's fabulous, it's wonderful. I'm glad we have it um, once a year as our you know, main practice. I really value it and treasure it and have relied on it um, for transformations in my own life that have been magical and really difficult. But there are sometimes, I believe, the language of forgiveness itself is just the wrong language. It's the wrong paradigm because it suggests that I have to somehow acknowledge a letting go of hurt or damage or whatever has occurred and, f and I absolve somebody of what they've done to me by forgiving them. For me, that is not a helpful paradigm. And, and I think, like I said earlier, I think it's disempowering for some people who have been the victims of abuse to say, I absolve the other person. I forgive them. I don't find that at all helpful. So what, so what do we do, right? So I'm not gonna leave you with and so therefore it doesn't work. <laughs> Instead, for me, because what do you do with somebody who's not sorry? I mean, because that, that's, that's for me the heart of it. The suffering and abuse and betrayal and constant damage that I still have to work at all the time undoing, right, and, and holding differently so that I continue to be a productive, creative, hopeful person. My mother's not sorry for that. She's not sorry for what she's done. So how, how do I, why, why does forgiveness become the paradigm when somebody is not remorseful, not regretful, doesn't take responsibility, and doesn't ask for your forgiveness. Why is that the spiritually mature response to let it go? It's one response, and as I said earlier, if people find that useful and helpful, I'm 100% in support of whatever people find useful and helpful. It wasn't for me, and actually it was really irritating. When I would hear sermon after sermon after sermon at the high holidays about forgiving. And it's about you, it's not about them, and it's the higher path, and the higher, the, you take the high road, right? When they go low. When they go low, you go high, or what? And I'm like, okay, I get that, that for some people that works. It really, it's, at times it felt insulting, and at times it felt like, so I'm spiritually immature, I'm clearly on the low road. I'm hanging on to my resentment. Some people tell me that's going to give me cancer. That's going to give me a heart attack, right? You know, all, all that kind of um, spiritual new age junk food, spirituality that we get that you're causing your own illness, you know? And so there were times it was not only not helpful, but it really felt like I was alienated from kind of the central message, a, a core message of um, the high holidays. So, for me, I think one of the important shifts, someone just stopped me earlier to say, 
that for her, who had the similar uh, situation with an abusive parent, her father, she said understanding her father was really important for her. That's how she came to terms with it, understanding he was ill, understanding how he understood the world, understanding where his reactions come from and, and how that shaped and formed who he is and who he was in their relationship. That's great. That's awesome, right? That she has found a way to hold that experience and to hold it to his you know, presence or absence you know, in, in her life. For me, understanding helped, sure, studying, reading every book I could get my hands on once I understood what borderline personality was, what narcissism really is. Um, yes, that was incredibly helpful for me to understand it wasn't me. Why can't my mother, the one who's supposed to love me more than anyone in the whole world, and who adopted me, who chose me, who picked me, who went to attorneys, who paid a lot of money for me, right? I wasn't an accident. I was wanted, desperately. What's wrong with me that she can't love me? That, that understanding her condition doesn't address, right, that, the, that place, that wounded, incredibly damaged child who says, what's wrong with me? This, right, we, that's just who children are. That's how they understand the world. It has to be about them, because that's, we know that's how the child's mind works. So understanding was a part of it for me, a, a much bigger part of it for me in a paradigm um, that works for me better is that forgiveness is not the goal. For me, in the relationship with my mother, the re forgiveness has nothing to do with the conversation. It's like when we talk about redemption and we talk about redemption from, and I ask a group of Jews, <laughs> redemption from what? What is redemption? Redemption from what? And they all, a lot of them say sin. Right? Right? Because that's, that's the paradigm, redemption from sin, because that's what we, you know, growing up in a Christian country, that, you know, that's, that, that's the, the relationship, right? That's the pairing. Well, pain in a relationship, at the holidays, forgiveness, right, is the, is the pairing. And for me, that is not at all part of the conversation, and it's not part of how I think about it or what the goal is. For me, the goal is, and the point is healing. That's, that's the goal. That's it. And that's huge and is going to take me the rest of my life, right? It should be a long and healthy one. Um, healing is the point for me. And I think for anyone who's experienced incredible pain and abuse and betrayal uh, and a power dynamic where you don't have the ability to defend yourself, um, healing for me is the point, not forgiveness. Part of healing for me, I think, is that what is my response to that pain? What, what, what do I do with that pain? Because that pain is not going to go away. And that's not a goal for me anymore. It used to be. Um, lessening it, having it be less dominant, you know, a, a voice, having it color less of my world, certainly is part of healing. Absolutely. But what I've found as I've gotten older and I've done this rabbi work, I'm a rabbi 24 years now, doing this work, I realized that I don't want that pain to go away because that pain is my entry point into anyone else in my congregation's pain. It allows me a depth of compassion and empathy that nothing else could give me except an experience of that kind of trauma. If you're pushing a, a, a bit of a button, so I'm sure. trying not to push yeah. it too hard. Um, I totally right understand and get that from the perspective professionally. Mm -hmm. I am curious, and if you're willing to go there in mm -hmm. the circumstances, whether that same pain is as helpful in your personal life. Because sometimes the greatest problem I find myself going through is that it gives me great access when I'm talking to someone with whom I have not at the distance, which, although we are close to our congregants, there's at least some healthy distance. But that doesn't help so much when you are talking to a parent, a child, a spouse, or whatever, and you lack that thing. For the same reason why we have difficulty in all those personal issues, so we don't, under, we don't operate on our kids and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm really curious about that. So for sure, and I so appreciate you being willing to, to 
to bring that up and, and I know when we get reactive, it's like, you know, like I feel it happening. Yeah. So thank you so much for the way you phrase that and so respectfully bringing that up. Because it's important, yes. So it's m so helpful in my professional life, right? Because I can say to people in my congregation, bring it. Whatever it is, bring it, I, you, right? I got it. So um, in my personal life, it absolutely is a huge challenge in relationships not to get triggered by the pain, right? The, that my trauma can, can trigger something just in my partner's tone of voice, yeah. right? When she says something, and, and she, she, I don't think she had a problem with me saying, like when she says, you know, as I'm leaving the house, drive carefully. It's like, no. <laughs> no, I thought I'd be really reckless today. I do 80 on sunset. Like, of course I'm going to drive. Like, so, like, my, my, resp my responses are not normal to drive carefully. Because it's like my mother, you know, I can, I, right? I can hear because I know you won't. Because you're such an idiot. And a congregant would never say that. Even if they said that, it wouldn't hit you. It the wouldn't same hit way me the same way. So I 100% I yeah. understand that in my personal life, it is very much a challenge. However, having done a lot of mindfulness work, I still find that the pain, if I, if I can be in touch with, here it comes. Right, she just said drive carefully. She has a great intention. She wants me to arrive safely because she loves me. So I have to let it come up and go, give myself two seconds, right? To, to hold what's happening and say, thank you, I will. In other words, it's not that the pain isn't there or my reaction isn't there, right? Out of pain and, and, and abuse. It's that I'm able in mindfulness practice to feel it come up, know it's coming up, and try really hard to respond out of not that, yeah. like what I know she intends. Um, and it means I always have to check what I assume someone intends also. Right, I always have to go, uh, did you see she just left the room? You know, Josh is gonna leave this session early. Yeah, I knew he wasn't gonna like what I had to say today. <laughs> Right, right. So I always that's, have to check. That's why. Check. I told you, that's why. <laughs> that's why, which is why he told me he was going to leave early. <laughs> right, because we have to check our assumptions. Right, because because that place of pain and damage is going to assume Josh is judging what I'm saying and is leaving. So I always have to. I always have to be mindful and careful about my assumptions about what people intend. But I have found that in my personal life, one of the best tools for me in parenting, I have a 14-year-old daughter, your condolences are welcome. <laughs> um, she's very much like me. God help us both. And when I see her and she's coming at me with you know, her being 14 and a, and a big personality, it's incredibly helpful when I want to go, <laughs> you know, I can, I can feel it and I'm ready to snark at her because we just are tired and we're short and I'm impatient and I've had a long day and you have the nerve, you know, to like now complain about walking the dog or whatever it is and, and, I, and I'm getting ready for my just regular human tired snap and what, what immediately happens for me is remember what that felt like. Re re be very careful what you say next because I know some of the heat is how I learned to cope with damage, right? Because it's way easier to be angry than to be afraid or victimized or powerless or hurt or sad. So anger is a really easy place to go. So whenever I feel myself getting angry, it, it has really helped me parent consciously and intentionally and mindfully to go immediately to what, what did it feel like when that happened to you? And you know, my mother's full wrath was delivered. Um, and, and it has stopped me. You know, the, the scene of Moshe on the rock and God says, come, come be in the cleft of the rock and I'm gonna put my hand over you and you'll see my achorai, you know, you'll see my behindness. Um, because you, if, you, you can't see me bahai. A person can't see me and, you know, it's usually translated live. Um, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really powerful metaphor for me about like protecting my daughter from the fullness of me, mm. shielding her because she can't handle it she, and high, right? And live the life that she would live if I didn't damage her by showing her the fullness of my whatever it is right in that moment. Um, and so, yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's complicating. Yes, it makes me not the easiest partner like, to, to do life with. 
and not the easiest mother, I'm sure, and has been super helpful uh, in helping me reparent myself, right? So that's the other thing, healing, and then finding the opportunities to redo, not undo. I can't undo my childhood. I can't undo what's happened to me, but I can redo. I can go forward and create the situations where I get to redo stuff that helps shore up. It's like another stitch in the wound, right? The wound is here and, and it's gonna take the rest of my life, you know, <laughs> stitching. But it's another stitch in that wound every time I bite back what I'm wanting to say to my daughter. Every time my partner says, drive carefully, and I go, thank you, I will, right? It, it's just another way to take, to take ownership of my behavior, to take ownership of the situation, to take um, responsibility. And I'm not saying I'm successful, even a majority of the time. Um, but it's also a way for me to, um, to experience agency. Because so much of the damage is about not having agency, right? If we're abused as a partner, often we don't feel like we have the agency to fight back or to, to do the alternative of leaving. And often people don't right, have the alternative to leave for many reasons. Um, but particularly as children, we, we couldn't. You just have to figure out how to get, get through the situation. Um, and so having agency in all those, mind, you know, with, with intention and with mindfulness and with attention and intention um, is, is a way to redo relationships, redo, you know, and recreate a reality that's not a reflection, in the negative sense anyway, of, of my own suffering. So parenting for me has been actually, and, and, and I'm really glad I got a girl, because I think the mirror, I, I have more compassion for my mother, because I can see how I would have pissed her off royally, like, right, I, I have more empathy and compassion for my mother. Um, and the, the mirroring is really powerful, and so it's re, reparenting my little girl by parenting my little girl has been hugely, hugely uh, important for me. Josh, did you want to say um, Thank you. What, what you just have been saying is, is really beautiful. And this notion of radical empathy as a way of, of inviting healing is, is an extraordinary concept, and I, and I hear you trying to uh, direct us towards what, what it means to do that as opposed to this concept of forgiveness, but uh, which, which I, I want to push back as a question. Mm -hmm. I, I'm challenged by your definition of forgiveness as being the only definition of forgiveness, and mm -hmm. would, would you introduce this sort of radical empathy as, as another definition of forgiveness? Because, um, because there, is, there is an element that, uh, that does, I guess, there's a possibility, there, there's an element of a relationship that still exists for which the healing, a, a healing experience can never completely repair. You might be for one or the other. So this act of, I, I think I'm gonna call it forgiveness. Maybe you don't like that, and I, I respect that. There, there's something active about the sort of repair of the relationship that I'm wondering if you are also attentive to. Because I can be healed by a traumatic, abusive relationship by learning how to turn away and bolster myself and become radically empathic with my other relationships, but this still gnawing wound that is traumatizing me for the rest of my life is gonna be there. So what do I call, what, how do I do yeah. that? Yeah, so um, thank you for leading me into the next part of my uh, talk, mm -hmm. right. Josh. Um, which is, I, it's not that I, so I don't find the language or the idea of forgiving my mother as helpful. But I do find the language of forgiveness incredibly powerful and incredibly helpful, kind of exactly where you were going, which is I find forgiving the universe to be my work. I work on forgiveness all the time. I try really hard to find what it is this year about forgiving the universe. Um, 
where is that for me, right? So I want. I, I know for, what you mean, but I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to unpack it. So I, I forgive the universe for not being the kind of place it needs to be. I, or I shouldn't, I shouldn't put that on it. I forgive the universe. I forgive God for unfolding in this world in such a way that children like my mother were traumatized and so become borderline narcissists. I forgive the universe most days. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of days I don't, right? There's a lot of days I'm in a dark place and, right, that I'm like, screw this. And you know, like she said, the, the sky is gray. I don't wanna hear about any blue. I see gray, what are you talking about, right? So I'm not saying I'm there all the time, but forgiving the universe is really helpful for me because it allows me to use the compassion I feel even for my mother. Not to forgive her. She's not asking for forgiveness. She's not sorry. But it allows me to forgive the universe that allowed parents to leave her and a drunken mother to abandon her and a father to take off and her grandparents who she was left with to say, go cut your own switch off the tree for us to whip you with when you misbehave. That, that's what I need to forgive. That the universe is constructed in such a way that that kind of suffering happens because that's what I believe produces the kind of cruelty that we perpetrate against one another all the time from the personal, you know, parent-child nuclear family um, situation to global relationships between nations and people. That I, I have to work all the time on forgiving the world. And that's what, what you know, Rosh Hashanah is all about, right? Is talking about the world as we have it, and the world, Yom Harat Olam, the world that is in potential. If I can come from a place of forgiving reality, capital R, as Rabbi Rami Shapiro would say, reality, capital R, right? That's how he references God. And if I can forgive reality, capital R, for being what it is, it frees me in that way I think you were talking about, in the way that forgiveness is helpful, if not personal. So I'm I'm curious, maybe you're planning to go there, but so you've done all this work. What, what happens to your relationship with your mother? Like what? It's really interesting. So we hadn't spoken in nine years. Um, I didn't know I was cutting off contact with my mother. We had had just one of the usual horrible, horrible email, you know, some email exchange that for her. I mean, it was one line, but it was like, I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. Like for that week, <laughs> like, you know, I'm just not gonna go back to, I can't stand, it just, this is so typical. Like, I'm just done, I'm done. I didn't know that that meant done for nine years. But it turned out I didn't respond, I didn't contact her, and she didn't bother to contact me. I, I should say, a few months later I got a card in the mail with her return address on it, and I could see through the thin envelope the words, I'm sorry, on the card. And I showed it to my partner and I said, Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. <laughs> There's an I'm sorry card from my mother. I rip open the envelope, I open the card, and it's one of those that's blank on the inside. It just said I'm sorry on the outside. I'm sorry on the outside. You open it and it says that you choose to be so self-centered and so rigid and so punishing that, right, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know what? Who goes to the store and picks out an I'm sorry card? <laughs> to send that says, I'm sorry, you're such an asshole. <laughs> that's, a, that's a purposeful level of like, what? That I was like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just done for a while. Um, but since after that, she didn't reach out again, I thought, I'm not reaching, what am I reaching out for? She can say she's sorry or whatever. Um, and it turned out to be nine years. Uh, and it involved my daughter, it was something that had involved my daughter, and I was like, you know what, I will not expose my child to the kind of, how come my grandma can't love me this week, right, that I had experienced, and so, um, so it, it, it was fine with me after that we didn't have contact, but it was hurtful and painful and terrible and horrible in all the ways you can imagine. Um, then my mother had this massive stroke, and I called mm -hmm. and my aunt and said, because I wasn't sure she was going to live, and I said, I'm coming. Like, I need to, I need to come. Um, and so my aunt said, well, don't do anything yet. Let me talk to your mother. I said, okay. So she talks to my mother, tells my mother this, and my mother says she can write me a letter. Oh. 
I can audition, right, to, to come out to see her. And, and I thought, you know what, like, there's nothing I have to say in the letter. No. So, um, so we, we didn't have time. But someone, a volunteer at the nursing home, like a year and a half later, which is recently, reached out to me to say, I don't know what's going on between you and your mother, what the deal is, but she's very, I don't know what words she used, and she wants to talk to you. Um, so when my aunt was there, I arranged to do some kind of video, you know, whatever. And there was the lion literally defanged. Her dentures don't fit anymore, you know, because of all the changes from the stroke. And so there was the lion defanged in the nursing home bed. And it was like, okay, fine, I can talk to her. You know, like, there wasn't a lot of anger, there wasn't a lot of, it was just like, okay, she's a poor, pathetic woman paralyzed in a bed and okay so hi mom <laughs> what's happening <laughs> like, so i just tried to make it as normal as possible and i felt very little other than pity and rahmanis and um but not forgiveness do, do you see what i'm saying like there, it just doesn't enter into it for me it's the I could fi fi face her as a human being who has suffered something horrible, and it could be separated from what she'd done to me. I could just be present to her as a human being. Yeah? Um, wait, wait, but did I get to your original but Yeah, that, that was point? the question, is what happens in the relationship? So there is, for me, there isn't one. You know, there, she is who she is. Now, she, I don't know who she is. I don't know exactly, you know, what's happening there. Um, but I wasn't interested in a relationship with who she was. And that's how nine years went by, was because like, I was not interested in being in a relationship to that. Had she called, had she changed, had she asked forgiveness maybe, or, or just kind of said, can we talk about what happened? Why we're not talking? Maybe, I don't know. And I'm not gonna tell anybody you know, like, where they need to be with that. But for me, it was not, it, it didn't happen. And also I wonder if you could just talk about what healing means, yeah. <laughs> what the process is. Yeah, so let, let me, let me hold. Let me hold that for a minute. Yeah. Uh, the, the word that comes to my mind, I'm sure, if you did that, was acceptance. And acceptance is kind of one way. I, I accept this is the way it is. Uh, forgive. And Mordecai Finley has been off of very fine gradations, but forgiveness basically means I'm willing to resume a relationship with you. I've come, got, got past whatever happened. That's really. And I understand that at the personal level. But then you talk about capital R reality. And I'm curious if, you, if what you're talking about is forgiveness. Does I have a relationship with God now understanding this? Or if you're talking about acceptance saying, that sucks, but that's the way it is, so go on, you, you do your thing, I'll do mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really important, right? So um, on the best days, it means I forgive you, and so I want to have a relationship with you in the way that I can, given who you are, <laughs> world, <laughs> right? I, right. Um, on bad days, you know, it's like, I work for you. Really? Like, really? <laughs> Right? Um, forget it. We're not like I don't want to. I don't want to. No. Um, but but ultimately, that's not a way forward, right? That's not a way to engage in in life that's going to be helpful. And for me, for other people, it's not heal, right to heal. Means okay, how do I get to forgiveness from acceptance? Right? I accept that this is the way the world is. I mean, hopefully, most of us get to that, right? It's another level, exactly what you said, like to say, I, I forgive, meaning I'm willing to engage with what I know can hurt me and what I know can devastate me now that I have a child. Right. Um, yeah. It's kind of a hypothetical, so there's not really an answer I understand, but I'm curious in the card that your mom sent, if the I'm sorry card was really an I'm sorry card, would you have been ready to forgive her at that moment? What, what would that have looked like? I don't know. I would have been willing to dialogue. Mm -hmm. I would have been willing to entertain the notion that she and I were, could get to a different place from where we were. It would depend right, on what unfolded in that conversation. Had it been a real I'm sorry card, first of all, that would have been a first. <clears throat> because the woman has never said she's sorry to me or anyone that I know of ever. Ever. So even just, and, and I'm not trying to make a big deal of that, I'm trying to say just to, for my mother to say I'm sorry in writing would have been the heavens opening and like challenging reality as I know it, the world as I know it, because it, 
it's not possible for her. Does that make sense? So A, that would have been a huge deal. It would have meant something really big happened for her that I would have wanted to know a lot more about. So yes, I would have been definitely ready to engage in a conversation. Um, what it would have taken for me to for forgive her, I don't know, you know what that looks like because it didn't happen. Um, I just want to share um, a, a story, um, since we're doing a lot of storytelling today. When I was very, very new to hospice work and I encountered the first patient who had, I think, four children, none of whom visited ever, oh. ever. And this woman was alone and she was dying and no one and you know, we made calls to the family and they said, no, thank you, no thanks, I oh. want nothing to do with her. And I expressed to the social worker with whom I was working my distress. I said, you know, this is just so terrible and so sad. And she said pretty much what you've been saying, which is never forget mm -hmm. she was not always a sick old woman lying in bed. And, um, and that is when I began to develop my theory of limitations. You know, we're all limited, some more limited than others. And sometimes our limitations are you know, not signing up for more abuse, more pain, eat, you know, it, it, lovely that the defanged piece for some people works, but for some people that doesn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. And that um, the, uh, clearly out of four children, I mean, not even one, you know, was willing to, to come near this person. Not a hero child in the bunch. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Nobody got spared. But it was just, it was a, you know, it was a very big lesson for me about um, what we, aspire to be able to do and what we can do without harming ourselves. Amen, amen, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your vulnerability. I, I'm really compelled in, in the theological implication of what's being discussed in terms of the high holidays, mm -hmm. because I kind of put it under the category of evil. What is unforgivable? Mm -hmm. That which is evil. And this year I'm exploring um, just the idea of, of evil coming from human agency only. Mm -hmm. And the concept of God we're invited into is a concept of human perfection that's unattainable. And I read recently something, because I, I put evil under the biblical narrative category of Amalek that then mm -hmm. Chinese pinball machines down to Nazis and Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. And I read recently, and I just want to share it, this, um, this reflection uh, from a Holocaust survivor on forgiveness, um, because I think it speaks really directly to the concept that you're going into. Mm -hmm. She says, um, the day I forgave the Nazis privately, it's Ava Moses Kaur. The day I forgave the Nazis privately, I forgave my parents. No, the day I forgave the Nazis publicly, she went and to the liberation on the 50th anniversary. Privately, I forgave my parents, whom I hated all of my life for not having saved me from Auschwitz. Children expect their parents to protect them. Mine couldn't. And then I forgave myself for hating my parents. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is really nothing more than an act of self-healing and self-empowerment. I call it a miracle medicine. It is free, it works, and it has no side effects. <laughs> the first time I read yeah. that, yeah. I cried yeah. and cried and cried and cried. Yeah. I, yes. I mean, I mean, I mean. And her parents couldn't protect her from Auschwitz. And her parents did not deliver that upon her. That's, the, that's, that's, why, that's where the pivot is for me in terms of does forgiveness work or not? I'm confused. She says, I, forg I forgive my parents for not being able to, to save me from Auschwitz. They couldn't. That wasn't possible. But she blamed them because parents are supposed to protect. Do, do you see what I'm saying? They, they were powerless to protect all, her. All, anyone who commits evil, what I hear you saying, is powerless to protect. Do you think but I, there's evil? That's evil. No, right. right but so my, maybe this isn't a perfect parallelism. Sure. Right. So what I'm saying, the difference, and I'm not, I'm, right. And I think it's very powerful. And it's, it's a way that we can you know, look at forgiveness even in really difficult right, circumstances, which is really helpful and illustrative. Thank you. I guess what I want to focus on is where it, where, it, where it changes from not being a helpful term, forgiveness, is when it's, the evil is perpetrated by someone who is not sorry. I don't forgive the Nazis. She forgave the Nazis. 
Well, that, that's the reflective, that's what's so powerful about this, is when she was able to forget that evil that was unilaterally evil, she then was able to go through that. I said, maybe I missed that. I didn't hear her. Machine of, I didn't hear her forgive the Nazis, so maybe so I just missed that. When you can forgive ultimate evil, then all the other intricacies can come. But the thing that we're Got wrestling it. with, I think, is evil. Okay, right. So, um, so I, right, so that, that kind of is, if it, I, again, I'm sorry, I just missed it where she forgave the Nazis. I heard her forgive her parents and herself. Um, oh, yeah, right, when you said when she publicly, yeah. so um, that is exactly that point of forgiving the universe yeah. for being the kind of place that would lead to the rise of Nazism and people voting them into power, right? People who were good, probably really good people in you know, most circumstances, voting that right regime right into power or not. Right. So um, yes, I think that's absolutely. Um, and then the effect of that right, is that we can forgive lots of other stuff once we start there. We have to wrestle with evil like, is what I'm presenting. Yes. We have to wrestle with, with this idea of the presence of evil in our lives. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, so for me, always the linchpin is where and how is our language of forgiveness helpful and where is it not? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Eva Poor came to my synagogue and for this very reason. And she actually forgave Mangala. Wow. There's a video, it's so powerful. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, so I just wanted to add that in because you're right. And I um, can talk to you more about this too. Like, if you forgive someone who killed someone, I mean, what are the levels? I, I, what, and what I've found, what you're saying, you have so beautifully uh, for us outlined the process and the depth mm -hmm. of forgiveness. Like, by t taking us through your story, there's so much to this simple, you know, slicha, slicha, that I think that going over it every year at High Holidays is like chipping away every, all of these dimensions that are stuck in one word that we think means letting people off the hook. That little piece, that somebody got away with this, that they could live their life causing so much pain and evil, will still happen, like in my, in my process, and I, I don't want to go into that right now, it will still happen. And, and where, where sometimes it's helpful is to not to have an expectation of how that person says I'm sorry. That little barely sorry, isn't it sad that was the best that she could do? Like, I mean, just knowing, it's like, it's really looking at a person as if they're missing a leg. There just comes this point where, how are they supposed to walk over to you? Now the Mangala thing, which is very interesting, is it, here's the other component of forgiveness that makes it complicated. I'm sure you've heard this word. I don't. This, this saying, this is either comes from um, twelve step. It comes from somewhere, but it was very profound. That forgiveness <coughs> is about that we look at it as letting. We're so afraid we're going to let someone off the hook, or, or they're not going. They're going to get away with something. That if it comes, it's for giving away so that it doesn't keep yeah. stirring yeah. in you. It's like it lets the wheel stop. And you've done everything that you can, and now you move on. And that's what Eva Kaur said in, in so many words is, yeah, I could keep going over the story. And, help, and, and you need to. See, that's part of the process. But every time, it's almost like then it starts to come out here and you're watching a movie. Like you have no feeling about it anymore. Cause, cause, and you did it. When you saw your mom in that last moment, you wanted her still to say she was sorry. That was your, you know, and we do, we want some, ugh, we want to, but we don't get it that. Because in forgiveness, all you get is kind of this like ability to watch it like it's on a movie screen. And we don't know that's the end product. We want some kind of redeeming, gone, done, scales are equal. Forgiveness doesn't give us that. And that's the, bit, that's the other piece to remind ourselves. It's very disappointing. What we think forgiveness is, has to be reevaluated and played with because it's a big disappointment. We think that it's like redemptive. And it's actually 
for you. It's a very self-healing thing, which you showed us how you did. And it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And a lot of work. And, yeah. And, then, and also, I love that maybe it gives people a chance. And being not there yet, like the quote about holiness, you're just not there yet. That will help, I think, a lot of people. You don't have to be there yet. Mm -hmm. So I want to say two things. Number one, um, in appreciation for you bringing this up, is to understand that people who are sitting before us at the High Holy Days, that we have no idea what they're sitting with. And so I was aware that in the um, meditation that Naomi did for um, Yisker, that I had to make a decision. And she said, think of someone and put them before you. And I had a feeling that I could put someone that was easy, my grandma, you know, my grandmother, grandfather, but I made a decision to put my dad, who um, never said, et cetera, okay, similar. And I decided to put him. And that meditation was not healing for me. Do you know what I mean? There was an assumption when she did it, which I think would have been beautiful if I put my grandmother there, but I didn't. So what I, what my experience was in doing that is the second thing I want to say, which is connected to you said, is that you have been working at this for years. And somehow, like in our liturgy, what happens in that liturgy of Rosh Hashanah is somehow we communicate it to people, okay, you've got 10 days. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> they don't start, they don't start in a little. And then the expectation is that, okay, I'm gonna take this complex relationship and figure it out, and I'm gonna come back on 10 days, and I'm gonna like seal it up. And I then I think that people end up feeling that they have failed. Yeah. Rather than to communicate right. that we're this is a journey. Okay, this is one year, and maybe this year you get one <clears throat> spiral closer to wherever it is you're going to end, and that everyone's process is different. So language of fractions is always really important to me <laughs> as a spiritual practice, right? So yeah. what part of healing yeah, a yeah. relationship feels, yes. you know, pressing for you this year? What piece of blah, blah, blah feels like it's really present this year, right? So I, I use the language of, of fraction, of pieces and parts a lot for exactly that reason, because I feel like we are pushed to kind of, and I was raised in a very traditional Jewish setting. I went to private Jewish day school and then yeshiva high school, um, Davin and an Orthodox school. And, and so I, I loved feeling Yom Kippur, you were having this you know, amazing suda because you were forgiven. It was all done, right? <laughs> yes, we are, like, it all got fixed yeah. and, and it was an avera. It was a sin to believe that God is so stingy that God can't forgive you. Whatever you've done is so terrible that God isn't big enough to forgive it. So like, it was like, yay, it's all done. And of course, yeah. the, as we grow up, it's like, it's not all done at Yom Kippur. And, but to feel like we, we've gotten a piece, accomplish even if it's just for ourselves, is a, is a hugely important thing. And I think what you said is why I was wanting to talk about this and why I came out about it. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me after this article yeah. appeared in the Jewish Journal from my own, how many emails I got. Yeah. And after that sermon, how many people came to me, hugged me, and started sobbing mm -hmm. because they'd never told anybody. Because the other thing is that we're supposed to come from, from great families, and if we didn't, we're supposed to have figured out how, how to hold that, and how to let it go, and how to get past it, and how to take the higher, right? So we're not supposed to be carrying around all that pain and be a hot mess, right? Um, and so people really are ashamed about, about owning their own relationship to, to this kind of um, ab you know, abuse or, or, um, or experience. And so um, to really trust that there are people having this experience, whatever it is. And, and I just wanna encourage all of us to continue to be willing to put out there for people our own places of brokenness and then our own ways of addressing those because it is so empowering for people when they say, well, if, it's, if it happens to the rabbi, Look who thinks she's nothing. You know, like, like then, it's it's so important for people to, to feel permission to, yeah. to still be really struggling with, with some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Moshe, um, yeah. Some of you know I work at a very interesting laboratory, um, mm -hmm. an exclusive data community 
uh, the women's prison in Chicago, yeah. Larry did uh, similar work. Um, I, I, I wandered into this after thinking I was going to go dance. And, and I got this, I, I Sorry. This every, no, no, this is, uh, I do this every, every year, and I, I've written a whole sermon and pieces on it, and there's so many things that are being said. You have a lot of courage to tell your story. And I, I think that it's a personal journey that each person takes mm -hmm. with their pieces of themselves, their past, their parents, and so on. Mm -hmm. So these women, uh, as most of you know, I mean, if you can stereotype all you want, they are victims. And 90% of the women in prison or more have had some form of abuse, whether it's financial, uh, incest, et cetera, et cetera, violence in their lives. So they're constantly going through a process of forgiving themselves uh, for the crime or for other things that led to it. They do a lot of them work with puppies. They do a restorative justice pro projects. And so there's a lot of paying it forward. So there's times, what I was wondering with you as well, is that were there, are there times when we're working on forgiving someone, like our parents, our grandparents, our abuser, um, when we're not able to do that work? And so we do it with someone else. And so we what? And we do it with someone else. Uh -huh. We forget. So one of the pieces that I, I found, I'm getting to it. The, there was a quote that I found by the OD. I don't have it here because I've got my, my whole package, um, in which he says, all of Israel is one soul. And uh, that essentially we are here to forgive others. And as we forgive them, we receive forgiveness. So I like to say, when we forgive someone, the angels get ice cream for dinner. <laughs> you know, I, there's this ecology of the apology, and that's the name of my sermon. And so you sometimes, these people, they, they can't contact their victims. They're not allowed to in some cases. Some of them are not in touch with their families. Some of their families are deceased, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the people, this is not just prison, many people in recovery work with other people and in the process of healing themselves of so you might have been working with other families in your synagogue that had bad relationships with their parents, and then this bubbles, that's the bubble of service, but you finally said, you know, I'm going to work on this with my family. I mean, I think if we're honest, that's what we're doing all the time. Like, if we're honest, right. we're, we're working out our stuff all the time with every single encounter that we have, right? And every encounter is an opportunity for me to either be present and be really um, thoughtful about how I respond instead of react, or be reactive because it's a terrible day and I'm in pain and I've had it, right? And it's four o'clock. So um, I think that's what we're doing all the time. But yes, absolutely, 100%. We have a tendency to okay, always thank you. go to the extreme. I'm sorry? Oh, there's a tendency to always go to the extreme and say, what about the Nazi? What about the terrorists? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on forgetting Stephen Miller right now. Right, so yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, the, the power of what you've shared is your personal experience. Um, but I want to see if, if, if you want to step out of that personal paradigm for a moment. Because I think often we have theoretical models and personally we just can't live up to them. And I think that's, you know, wholly permissible, right? Because we're only human. So I'd love to see if I could push you out. I think someone tried to do it a little bit. In, in the scenario of where somebody does offer an apology. And there you felt like you responded from your personal state. What well, might have been, but but what happens in the model of forgiveness there, where where the the wrong is just so egregious? How how would you handle that outside of your own personal experience as a theoretical model? Um, I don't know that I'm really attached to any theoretical model about this. True. I mean, I would have to give it some more thought before I could come back with one. But I think for me. Um, it's all about like what's in the apology, right? If the wrong is so egregious, so are, you, are you suggesting like so the, someone apologizes to me and they really mean it, but I feel like the wrong is so egregious that I can't forgive? Right, right. Is it right? Is there a theoretical model that says it should be forgiven in your mind? You may not, you may not have taken it to that extent, uh -huh. right? Because this is all from your personal experience sure. and, and this model. But but would would you be able to extrapolate in terms of it's a sincere, but it's just so egregious? Can't can't forgive Mangala. What about and what about Harvey Weinstein or what about Mangala? Right. So so here so okay. First, I'm yes. going to say here's the difference. Mangala didn't ask for forgiveness, right? Correct. So that so that's why I want to stay with yeah, didn't yeah, ask yeah. for. It. So someone who does ask for it, Correct. I would love to believe that I will someday be somebody who can respond to the honest apology and their desire to change with forgiveness. 
That is a hope that I have, that I will be somebody who can do that even if the harm was egregious. And I can imagine scenarios in which, again, it wouldn't be helpful. It would be like, I'm glad you're sorry, and, and I can sit and listen to that or support their change or whatever without necessarily needing to go to a place of forgiveness. Right. Does that make so, sense? So I'm trying to work out my own model because I'm actually going to, this is part of a sermon on giving. And the question is whether that one actually, forgiveness ultimately, I don't know whether it can be granted or not, but is proven by a life changed, right? Is, is that potentially in a model, like show mm -hmm. me what it's about? Yeah, right? Because sometimes, like what we said, it takes time, right? It's like, okay, you're, you're, you're saying you're sorry, because so the next time we're in a board meeting, and the next time you want to call me out and embarrass me in front of the board, like, I'm just picking by the most egregious <laughs> thing I can think of, right, as a rabbi, then does, that, does it happen or does it not, right? Do I see change? Do I see a real, a real attempt at progress? And, and then I think then I'm able to hold it differently because it's now a different reality. Right. So I, I think I'm changing that I'm right. I think I'm changing it from the forgiveness part, right, which is right, um, mine, to the repentant part, which is a completely different process. Right. And which is dependent on my granting it. Right. Show me a life that's right dedicated to repentance. So for for me, I think they are very closely related. Okay, so that's why I'm just for me that um that without repentance, I don't think forgiveness is particularly relevant. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Like yeah, yeah. No, for no, me, it's, that it's just not the answer. If there's no repentant feeling, thought, you know, behavior as a result, I, I'm not sure what forgiveness is doing there. Um, I, the gentleman over here, Plaid. Oh, hi, Paul. Oh, hi, Paul. Hi, I didn't see your face. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing this. Thank you for uh, pushing uh, my thoughts and ours and, and revealing. Uh, and I love the article. I uh, found it very helpful. Shared it with someone for whom it was even more helpful. Um, so here are my questions. Uh, I'm going to try not to do it as a sermon. Number one, I'm in a room with two people, 50 people, 100 people, my synagogue, you know, I'll be before I think a million and a half. Um, and I want to speak to, you know, the 22% who are in your situation with someone. And I also have the 78% who are in a different type of situation. So how do I speak to both of those, mm -hmm. number one? Number two, of the 22% who are dealing with this, let's say there's a small percent who are gonna use this model, this idea as a way of, there's a danger of them using this as a way of letting themselves off the hook by saying, what you just described, that's my mom, that's my dad, that's my friend, and it might not be. It might be my inability to push through whatever, I don't know what the psychological thing is. So those are uh, my two questions. I don't know what All right, so um, I just don't wanna forget my answers. So A, I wanna say, this sermon that I gave is on, is on YouTube. So you can see where I went with it. It's easier uh, for me to deliver it if you just put it in words that I can just bring up and then give it. <laughs> I got it. So what I want to say is I, I didn't keep the sermon with my personal experience because that's never what I do with a sermon, God forbid, because I do want to talk to 100% of the room. So I talk to the 22% very personally, but everybody in that room is dealing with forgiving evil. Or not forgiving evil, right? My, where I went with it is global. We all are living in a reality where terrible, horrible, awful things happen, and they're going to happen tomorrow also. So my sermon was, a ha so what do we do with that? Like, what do we do with a world that's so messed up? Because it was also, the world was pretty messed up that year. <laughs> Um, so, um, so my sermon was bigger, right, than just talking to the 22%. It always has to be. So I move from the personal, hopefully always, sometimes I get there better than others, I think, or it's more applicable than others, I don't know, um, to, so what do we do with the reality? Um, and what I want to say, two, two quick things about that is, um, is the act I, uh, of saying whatever we want to say about forgiveness to the 85% or whatever, Ugh, my math is terrible, the 80 something percent, um, I, I find that what I try to do is to say, and sometimes, right, so if I'm preaching about forgiveness and how fabulous it is, and sometimes, 
There are people and situations that we cannot forgive and in which forgiveness is not necessarily the paradigm. Right, right. It only takes a, a parenthetical statement to include, right, whenever I say, you know, people say, it's in my DNA, I'm a Jew. I always parenthetical, and I have not a drop of Jewish blood in my body. <laughs> it, it's a parenthetical that allows me to include everybody who might be excluded by the statement I just made. So I try to do that as a practice. Um, and, but the, so, so global, going global from whatever I start with, um, but also making sure, I, if I'm giving some sweeping whatever to include, right, the people who would be excluded by that statement. Um, and our practice of um, standing and reciting a confession is something I also really point out to people, particularly in these kinds of um, right situations. It, like, it's an act of taking responsibility for our behavior, and that is such an incredibly powerful thing taking responsibility, saying out loud in front of everybody, I've, I've done the very things that I'm struggling to forgive on some level. And it's in the plural. And it's in the plural because we've all done it, and it includes 100% of us, not 20%, right? So that's an incredibly healing practice, and I spoke about that. We're gonna stand up in a minute, and we're all gonna say out loud and take ownership of, in front of everybody, what we have perpetrated. And um, that is an incredible act of hope and maturity, right? And, and it makes me every year trust that we at least are trying, right, to, to be honest about the ways that we have, you know, messed it up um, and as we hold what it means to forgive other people, right, for the ways that they've messed up. That's one. Number two, it also helped me redeem Avinu Malkainu a little bit. Right? Avinu Malkinu, I don't believe in a personal being who's Avinu or Imenu or whatever, you know, Makor, Chayenu, whatever. I, right? I, I believe in something more amorphous than that, right? I need Avinu Malkinu because there's still that part of me, there's still the child who longs for protection. There's a child that longs for relationship to something, and I'm going to say thing, but it could be you could put in someone, some force, some something that allows me for a few moments to sacralize trusting that there is a universe that also holds me and that I am safe no matter what, including at the deathbed. I hope I get there. That at my death, I can say I'm safe. Right, the things I pray for people to feel as they're dying, that they're held, that they're safe, that their journey be easy and quick and, and one of peace, their rescue of peace. And, um, Avinu Malkinu for me is, it comes out of pain, right? That, that I, and, and longing to, to be seen, to be held, to, to affirm a trust that as crazy as this universe is, which I talked at the whole sermon about, um, it is also a place of incredible uh, beauty and there's a safety built into it. I know I have to close and so I want to close with um, a quote from uh, Annie Lamott uh, a couple of them. Um, she, I was reading her book just before I gave this sermon called Hallelujah Anyway. And then I had our choir sing um, the Hallelujah anthem because I needed a break and I needed to cry. Um, Anne Lamott says, mercy, grace, forgiveness, and compassion are synonyms. And the approaches we might consider taking when facing a great big mess, especially the great big mess of ourselves, our arrogance, greed, poverty, disease, prejudice. It includes everything out there just makes us, that just makes us sick and makes us want to turn away. The idea of accepting life as it presents itself and doing goodness anyway. The belief that love and caring are marbled into the worst life has to offer. That's where the sermon went, right? That, that's because I have to leave them there. I have to leave them with hallelujah anyway, or I have no business speaking to them. Why are they going to buy a ticket or join for next year? Right? I, it's the real act of, yes, we want to dig in, and yes, we want to be truthful, and yes, we want to face the hardest stuff we have to face, and I have to leave them. I have to get to hallelujah anyway, or I have no business being on the Bema. This is just my opinion. I'm not saying anything about anybody else. For me, my mission is to, to go into whatever we have to go into and to come out saying somehow, hallelujah, that we are here, hallelujah, that we've been given another day, much less another year, because we have no idea what's coming in this year, that we'll even have the whole year. Hallelujah, 
for a Jewish community, Jews who care enough to show up and confess out loud and struggle with the image of Aminu al and struggle with relationships and struggle with acting, asking forgiveness and granting it. Hallelujah. And that is the place each of us has to get to, right, in whatever we're um, talking about or presenting. Um, I wish for you um, a very strong and clear um, Hallelujah of Chazaka, and that you should have a Shana Tova, Metuka. Uh, and thank you so much for your incredibly present attention.